little bit about Surface Applied Thing Security, how we think about it, dig deeper into the reference architecture, and talk a little bit about the SDLC at each of our organizations, uh, and wrap it up with a demo and some learnings and takeaways. So um, before we get started, you know, some questions that we really ask ourselves as we are uh, securing our CSED pipelines. These are the questions that we ask internally ourselves, so it's good to you know, get a sense of how you're thinking about these. First question, how do you know if the code that you're building or the artifact that you're deploying has not been exploited? Would you even get to know? Second, can your developers bypass security controls in their CICD pipelines? As in, if you're providing a CICD pipeline to them, can they take out uh, scanning uh, out of the equation or delete that particular step, for example? The third one, how do you determine the blast radius and cost of an exploited uh, dependency? Do you have measures in place or instrumentation in place to be able to do that? So how many of you, show of hands, how many of you are able to relate to these questions or think that these are relevant questions to ask as we are building the CICD pipelines? Great, thank you so much. So as we think about software supply chain security, we believe that it's more than CICD, of course, but it starts with the onboarding. A lot of our organizations and enterprises in particular, we provide onboarding capabilities to developers. So we provide those templates, so we start with the templates or the onboarding uh, capabilities and go till the post deployments and the operations and everything in between, all of that needs to be secure. And um, when we think about security or sub uh, software supply chain security, we need to th also think about processes, workflows, and also people. A lot of the time, the organizations, they are too focused on architecture and design and they forget about the processes and the people part, which are equally important. And when you think about like you know the architecture in particular, you'd want to you normally have a layered kind of an architecture. So you would have infrastructure at the bottom and developer services at the top where the developers are interacting with the system. So you'd need to you know secure all these layers, you know, from the infrastructure right to the developer services. And what do you get in return? You get integrity, authenticity, and non-repetition. So with that, uh, let's uh, go to the reference architecture, but before that, we want to do a quick nod to prior art. Some of these uh, uh, frameworks and RDFI or you know, uh, uh, like uh, uh, papers such as Secure Software Factory or Secure Software Development Framework, these are already there and Salsa included. But I think the key point is that these are uh, there and we are also referencing it, but there are gaps, and that is why we're here. We feel that how they map to enterprises is somewhere like you know uh, not a one-to-one -one mapping. So we are here to talk a little bit about how we can use some of these learnings and map it to the enterprises. So let's look at the reference architecture now. So quick call out regarding the reference architecture before we get started. One, there's a lot that is going to happen in this diagram. It's going to get real dense towards the end. So that's why that's why we're going to build it incrementally. Second. Uh, that this architecture is going to talk about a lot of concepts over here. And uh, the intent is not to get deeper into you know, some of these concepts over here in this presentation. Each of these concepts might be a presentation in itself, uh, you know, and the idea is to give you a high level overview over here. So the third thing uh, that I'd like to mention is that, as you can see, there's GitHub, there's destinations, and then there is a foundation in between, as, as shown in this diagram. So it's trying to, the foundation is essentially trying to be a glue between the GitHub and the destinations, kind of like the GitHub's kind of a model, as we, um, as some of you might know. So what we are going to do over here is to see how this foundation is acting as the glue between the between GitHub and the destinations. So what we the first thing that we recommend is that you should have a two repo model. There's app repo and then there is a deploy repo. The app repo contains the business logic and the local development support, for example, but it also contains a CI spec, a CI spec which is kind of acting as an abstraction on top of the CI capabilities, such as the build, the scan, and the uh, you know the testing that happens during CI. And similarly, on the deploy side, you would want to have a CD spec which is abstracting out the complexity related to the CD steps, environments, deployments, runtime, API gateway, and such. And what we also recommend is that the platform team, they do the heavy lifting 
by defining these platform defined templates which are at a shared location for example and they are able to reference the developers are able to reference them in their ci spec and in the cd spec and get those uh, benefits or these capabilities you know just by you know uh, by by referencing them in the ci and the cd specs so uh, the last thing before we look at the workflow a typical developer workflow there are GitHub apps that should be installed on the app repo and the deploy repo, which help us capture the events that are coming through from the app repo and the deploy repo and be able to send them to the CI/CD foundation or the control plane. So with that, let's look at a typical developer workflow. What would a developer do? They would normally create a pull request. And as part of raising the pull request, you would see that uh, you know, there are a few checks listed. You would obviously have code reviews, but there are a bunch of checks that you would uh, want uh, to be you know, uh, executed at this point of time, which includes uh, things like you know, sign commit validation. We do recommend that you sign your commits when the commits are being made and validate them at the, at the level when you know, at the pre-merge level itself when the PRs are you know, uh, uh, when the PRs have been raised. Similarly, software composition analysis, which is all about uh, looking into third-party dependencies and open source libraries and looking for vulnerabilities, and SAST, which stands for um, security, uh, uh, static application security testing, which essentially is uh, you know, looking into the code and identifying vulnerabilities and you know, also looking at uh, the uh, insecure coding practices, for example. So, oh, sorry, what happened? Okay. Yeah, wrong button. So uh, once these checks uh, have passed, the, the pull request is merged. And from there, uh, using the event that is being captured by the GitHub app, it, it's sent to the control plane from where the CI pipeline gets triggered. Now over here, one of the first things that we'd like to do is to run some pre-built tests. Again, it is pointing to the same set of tests. We do recommend that you actually run all of these tests as much as possible pre-merge. But if for whatever reason you want to like, you know, have some of these tests being run as part of the CI pipeline, then you, you know, run these tests right at the top, like you know, just before the CI pipeline uh, is about to sort of build the, uh, build the artifact. The next thing, you want, might want to provision some certain resources. For example, you might want to provision the artifact store, so it, there could be a step related to that. And then you build the artifact. So at this point of time, you would want to capture the build provenance corresponding to the uh, artifact, as in uh, what is the origin and you know, how the, or the artifact has been built, including the details of the build system. And there is SALSA over here, which has been mentioned, which stands for um, uh, software, uh, uh, you know, it, so it stands for um, uh, supply chain levels for say, uh, software artifacts. And it's a, it's a kind of like you know, an open source standard which has incrementally adopted, adoptable levels. So it starts with level one, level two, and level three. And the you know, sort of rigor, it, it gets increased as the levels increase. So we recommend that you start with level one, but eventually get to level three. Um, so similarly, there is SBOM, which stands for Software Bill of Materials. And this is uh, uh, you know, basically a structured inventory of your, what your software contains in terms of the components and also the dependencies. So capture this information and include it as part of the artifact. Thereafter, you would want to scan the artifact and publish the scan results with the artifact itself. And after that, you would run some tests. Which, in, which might include integration tests, for example, and DAST and fuzzing. So DAST, it stands for Dynamic Application Security Testing. It's all about like, you know, uh, simulating real-world attacks on your application. And fuzzing is all uh, about like, uh, sending incorrect or malformed inputs to your application and trying to see how it behaves and trying to identify vulnerabilities as a result. So both these tests, they are actually very intensive and uh, time consuming as well. So we don't really recommend that you wait for these steps to be, uh, this, specifically these tests to be you know, successful before you move on to the next step. Just trigger them and they should be running in the background. So it's important to know that these tests exist but rather than like, you know, again, uh, that should be, become a dependency in the pipeline. Finally, you si sign the artifact. 
So signing the artifact before you actually sign it, please make sure that you are validating that the build information is correct. For example, the provenance and the SBOM information and the results have been scanned and those are available. And you are including uh, or you're validating all of that information before you sign it. And finally, uh, you push the artifact to the artifact store. So in the artifact store, make sure that you have uh, uh, separate repos by the uh, by, by different environments, for example, dev, staging, and prod, and uh, also have enough RBAC in place for your clients so that they are able to sort of access it without uh, you know affecting anybody else's artifacts. So once the CI pipeline is done, you would want to then trigger the CD pipeline. And as you can see over here, there's a manual gate in between. Some teams prefer to have like you know manual gate where there is you know human intervention, so you can choose to have it. But you know most of the times you would want to try to directly trigger the CD pipeline. But it's up to you. Like and if you want to adopt it, it's an opt-in kind of a mechanism. So one other call out, important call out over here, and that is kind of evident from the app repo and the deploy repo segregation is that. In the app repo, you know, the CI is actually an app concern. So that's why the CI spec is with the app repo. The CD uh, spec is, uh, or CD is basically a deploy related concern. So that's why the CD spec is with the deploy repo. Similarly, CI pipeline is separate and CD pipeline is separate. And you would want to maintain that segregation. Continuous integration and continuous deployment are separate concerns. Please don't mix them up. I've seen several organizations mix them up and have one single pipeline that caters to both of them. It, won't, it will actually help you for your architecture and for your future use cases if you keep them separate. So if there's one takeaway that you want to take away is you know this one, that separate the CI and CD. So uh, as part of the CD pipeline, you uh, log a change request for you know, the critical changes or for critical environments. After that, you would want to do some pre-deploy validations, which means that the artifact that you, were, you know, that you had signed previously as part of CI, is it really the same artifact that you're trying to deploy? You'd want to validate the signature, for example, for the artifact at this point, uh, at this point of time. And thereafter, provision the resources, which means that you could be provisioning the artifact cache um, or you know, provisioning uh, certain resources in the destination as well, for example, namespaces, if you want to provision them. And you know, thereafter, you up, up, uh, update the artifact cache with the artifact. Uh, and one of the things that we are recommending over here is that you have intelligent replication across regions, meaning if a particular application is deployed in three regions, you replicate the artifact to three regions only. If an application is deployed to 10 regions, then you replicate it to the, to the 10, 10 regions. So no brute force replication is what we recommend. Thereafter, you deploy and wait. Um, so as part of the deployment, if uh, you know, for people who are available, aware of the GitOps related um, you know, GitOps related principles, you would do a commit to your deploy repo. A GitOps operator such as Argo CD would get triggered. It will pick up the changes. It will try to apply those changes and, you know, the controllers would get kicked in. And at this point of time, there are some policy validations that might happen. So if you're aware of projects such as OPA Gatekeeper or Kyverno, for example, this is the point where you know your validations could take place, uh, you know, for the organization-wide validations, and you know if uh, things don't look good, you could you know fail the deployment also. But if the deployment really, uh, if the checks they pass, the policy validations they pass, you go on to do the deployment and to the destinations. So you can see that there are different type of like you know environments, uh, QA, stage, and prod, and of course like you know your naming would definitely be different from some of these names that have been captured over here. But the key point is that the artifact is being pushed, uh, being pulled from the artifact cache and not the artifact store, right? So that is by design. Don't uh, you know, mix up your build time and runtime dependencies on the artifact store versus the artifact cache. So one other thing to note is that even though the CD pipeline is shown as a sequence of steps, one single you know, uh, uh, linear set of steps, but in reality, it would be a DAG. Right, as you can imagine, there will be multiple environments, uh, you know, and the dependencies between the between the environments, and these kind of dependencies will be captured in the CD spec. 
which is there with the deploy repo. So you would define the dependencies over there. So if you visualize the CD pipeline, you would actually see a graph. Uh, over here, but for simplicity, it's been shown as like you know one single pipeline in this diagram. Um, once the deployment succeeds, you would want to then run some tests again, end-to-end -end tests, or you may want to trigger the DAST or the fuzzing-related tests once again. And finally, again, wrong button. Sorry about that. Um, and finally, you would want to uh, notify the user that your deployment has actually succeeded. And in fact, like you could do a similar kind of a notification at the end of the CI pipeline as well, inform the user that your CI has succeeded, um, and similarly for the CD pipeline. One other important call out in my, in my mind, which is that you, know, you should uh, prefer event-based communication between the components in your control plane in order to have a decoupled kind of an architecture. I mean, we found that to be really beneficial. And secondly, um, make sure everything is monitored and everything is observable. Okay? So these days, no presentation is complete without a call out for AI. So here it is. Uh, you'd be uh, <laughs> so you'd be doing a lot of these operations at your in your organization. For example, log analysis or resource optimization or vulnerability scanning. There's a huge opportunity over here to be able to leverage AI in order to make these processes efficient and more organized. So. Uh, with that, let me talk a little bit about like you know the Adobe specifics. So this, the previous uh, reference architecture that we just saw, one more call out. As you can see, it is largely technology agnostic. Actually, it's mostly technology agnostic, right? There's no technology mentioned anywhere over here, right? So that is by design, so that you can map your own technologies on top and be able to still use this reference architecture in your organizations. Okay, so as far as Adobe is concerned, we have been using Backstage and GitHub as the technologies for our pre-build and onboarding phases, Backstage for you know, our developer portal. And for the builder integration, we use Argo workflows to create our CI and the CD pipelines, and we are evaluating GitHub Actions for our future pipelines as well. JFrog Artifact as the artifact store, and AWS ECR as the, uh, uh, the tool of choice for you know, the artifact cache in some cases. And finally, we use Argo CD for uh, our GitOps use cases, Argo rollouts for our um, for you know, uh, like you know, the advanced deployment strategies, and uh, you know, using the custom operators or the uh, controllers, we use, uh, we do the deployments on Kubernetes as of right now. But we are expanding that to future use cases such as serverless and uh, static websites. And I'm, I'm going to wrap it up by talking a little bit about a new thing that we are looking into, which is the sealed paved roads. So as you can imagine in any enterprise these days, right? So you would have this uh, paved road for going from concept to code to cloud to customer, right? So all four Cs. So uh, what Adobe does as far as the paved road that it provides is, you know, we provide bootstrappable golden templates to go from concept to code and alongside do a bit of one-time provisioning as well. The developer, it uh, ends up with like, you know, hello world application and CI CD abstractions and, you know, uh, which are abstracting out the, uh, the capabilities which we talked about earlier, the, you know, the deployments and the observability and stuff like that. So for going from code to cloud, the CI CD pipelines that has been created already for them, they use that. They use the just-in-time provisioning that we were talking about in the reference architecture, and the advanced deployment capabilities, as I mentioned, using Argo rollouts. And then, one, what, uh, using, uh, once they're done with the deployments, what they end up with is a deployed application, security controls built in, API endpoints already available, observability, change management, secret management, all of that is already there, and it's, it's ready for them to use. So from going from cloud to customer is an interesting journey because we want to provide them with a single pane of glass experience where we are up-leveling a lot of the workflows for them so that they don't have to go to a lot of surfaces. We provide diagnostics, we provide unified support, which is again, you know, uh, uh, you know it's having a bot, uh, you know, a Slack bot under the hood where you can ask questions and get answers to your queries. So all of that is uh, actually great, uh, but I think uh, you know it looks more like a paved road, right? You know, it's definitely a paved road that we are providing. But what does a sealed paved road really mean? 
sealed means that the paved road is opinionated, the best practices are included, there are enforcements in uh, place at various places where the, the platform has a very strong opinion that this should be there definitely. There are reasonable defaults at uh, various places and there are abstractions for the places where the users don't need to worry about certain parts of the platform. Okay, but what does it mean as far as this workflow is concerned? So, what this really means is that there are very few options that are exposed in the bootstrappable golden templates. So, the users, if they don't need to know about certain uh, things in the during the onboarding, why even ask them? Right? If observability should be included, don't even ask. If logging should be included, don't even ask. Similarly, uh, when we're talking about the capabilities or access to those capabilities, that should be driven through the abstractions. Um, you know that uh, that we talked about, and then uh, as far as the CI/CD pipeline is concerned, you would want to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, for example, the, the ability uh, not have the ability for the developers to be able to modify the mandated steps. So, if, for example, if scanning or signing of the artifacts is being mandated by the platform, then they should not be able to, you know, just uh, snip the steps out of the pipeline. Those should happen in the background. They should be probably aware that it is happening, but they should not have any control over it. And finally, uh, production readiness best practices, which are mandated, as I was mentioning, like observability or for change management. These are best practices, right? So we want to include them in the pipelines by default and you know, not have the users be able to say that, I don't need change management. You, you need change management as far as production workloads are concerned. So, and finally, I think the uh, direct access to tools uh, should be uh, added to the bare minimum. And if, in fact, if they don't have access to the tools directly, that's actually better. For example, you know, do you want your developers to have direct access to Argo CD and Argo workflows? Or do you want to up-label all of those, those capabilities to the single pane of glass, which is exposed through developer home or the, the developer portal, which is based on Backstage? So we're trying to provide a lot of this functionality inside the single pane of glass so that you know, the direct dependency of the developers on the tools is reduced. And we are able to swap tools under the hood as a platform team if we need to in the future. So uh, as you can see, you know, the, the pipeline is, uh, the paved road is there. We are trying to seal it at different points in order to make it a little bit more secure. So with that, I want to do a, you know, a quick thank you or a call out to our developer experience team at Adobe, the security team, and the clients who have been very helpful, and hand it over to Jesse. Thank you. All right, can you hear me? All right, I'm going to try to pack 11 minutes into seven minutes. So let's see, I'm going to have to let my hair down for this one. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, before I do, I want to uh, ask uh, or say thank you to Jagadish, uh, who's on my AppSec team. Um, he helped me with this demo that I'm going to show you shortly. So let's do it. So uh, because Vikram did such a good job explaining that reference architecture, I just want to say that Autodesk is largely on board with that. Um, we agree with almost all of the controls that are in there. And in, fa in fact, the, the CI and CD that you saw there is largely the same as well, conceptually the same at least. Um, but one of the things that's different between Autodesk and, and you know, other organizations, um, although not necessarily um, different from some others, is that we have a lot of diversity. We have a lot of legacy software, brownfield stuff. Um, we also do a lot of mergers and acquisitions. That's kind of continuous process that's bringing new people in the door, um, the new technology stacks, uh, a lot of technology inertia that's just kind of ever-changing. Um, so we need something that was pluggable, something that would take equivalent technologies, equivalent control implementations, and wrap them so that it would you know, be abstracted to a certain degree. We also wanted something that was kind of pro progressively adoptable, kind of like what Vikram said, kind of like the Salsa framework, um, and it could be iteratively rolled out throughout the organization, different tech stacks at different times, um, <clears throat> depending on, on the risk profiles. Um, so, um, looking at uh, an S, uh, SDLC representation, again, largely similar, similar to what you saw in the slide uh, that Vikram put up. Um, I'm not going to go through each of these. They probably look familiar. Um, one of the important things is that I am going to show a demo with, with Jira in there. And I think that, that what, what, what is interesting about this demo is that it's bringing in this idea of ideation being a part of our SDLC and, and, and needs to be a provable part of our SDLC, um, which is kind of where some of those uh, uh, reference frameworks um, kind of didn't, don't, don't really go early enough in the process for me. Um, so when looking at 
that prior art, right? I did, I did take a look at it, uh, uh, kind of um, the um, Secure Software Factory Project white paper. How many of you have, have read that paper? Anyone? <laughs> Some people have actually contributed to that paper, so that, uh, that's not fair. Um, well, uh, and then how many of you are, are uh, uh, aware of the Salsa framework as well? Yeah, okay, so that, 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 that makes sense, a few more. Um, anyhow, in the Secure Software Factory and also in Salsa, and, and, and you know, in the SSDF alike, um, you know, they, they, they naturally focus on what the, the kind of like the, the bleeding edge of technology is to a certain degree. It focuses on, on kind of like where we're at. Where, I mean, we're at a CNCF conference, conference right? So, um, but Autodesk does not have only Kubernetes as its runtime. It's a big enterprise. We've got a lot of legacy stuff, like I said. So we need some way of like seeing all of those things comprehensively, right? And being able to write policies against the evidence that we can pull out of that SDLC that allows for those policies to be written in a way that doesn't have to be so point solution specific, right? Um, and, and thankfully, there, there is some tooling that's available to us, right? Um, the Intoto project, which how many of you heard of the Intoto project? Awesome. Awesome, right? The Intoto project office offers up this specification of, of metadata that they call attestations, right? And th thankfully, they also have this nice handy-dandy CLI tool called Witness, which helps us generate those. So another representation of that, that SDLC pipeline, right? We, here you see that we're, we're instrumenting CI steps to generate these attestations. Um, users can customize those steps. We allow them to kind of like build their own pipelines, but you know, they're still required to use kind of the, these core libraries that we, that we have kind of in the critical path of their CI. And through those core libraries, we're able to inject some of this kind of platform tooling level stuff that allows us to generate these attestations. Um, and if somehow they're able to kind of break out and not, not generate those attestations or not use those libraries, well then the attestations just don't exist, right? Um, and so then later when the policies are evaluated, the policies will fail because they just lack the input. Inputs. So, again, back to that platform tooling thing. That's kind of where my, my platform engineering hat comes on. Um, we want to get out of the way of developers. We want to make it easy for them, right? That's kind of the whole reason for platform engineering. And through these critical paths, through these libraries and, and platform tools that they're required to use, we can build things like abstractions, like you see here, uh, a Jenkins file including a build and push function. Well, that's really just building this Docker file. But because our AppSec team actually manages that build and push function, and it's included in all those builds, we can actually inject something like do, scan, and sign, you know, that little protected uh, a function at the bottom there. So now when they build their Docker uh, containers, they're actually getting uh, the build provenance and the signatures on those containers um, in line. So all of this leads to this thing that I'm, I'm calling this trust telemetry, right? And so all of these little attestations coming from all these different parts of that, that SDLC process, we need to put those all somewhere so that we can see them all. And if we can do that in a cryptographically sound way, we can start to build up trust on them. Each one of them by themselves might not necessarily be that trustworthy, but you take the whole picture, you kind of get this like aggregate that actually um, is much more powerful. And so where do we store those? Well, we we'll actually store those in the sister project uh, to uh, Archivista, or sorry, to um, Witness, which is this in Toto, in, in the Intoto suite as well, which is called Archivista. And Archivista lets us query and uh, uh, inspect that metadata uh, in, uh, a, in a graph API um, uh, that's composed of all those attestations that come out of SDLC. Um, and so like I said uh, earlier, like later in that CD phase, we can take a look at all those uh, uh, attestations um, and then we can judge whether or not we want to move to the next step in CD. Like each time we go to another step, we see if the attestations before it satisfy our requirements, maybe we don't want to deploy if things are not looking good. So I did a, a talk just recently in Japan at OSS Summit up uh, at their uh, supply chain security subconference about telling the story of the lifetime of a build. Like this concept of each build going through its process is really a tale of how that build was composed, who initiated it, who asked for the changes, and, and then can we tell that story in a cryptographically sound way and then build up trust and policy decisions. So if you want to take a look at that, that the video replay is out, uh, there at that link now. All right, so let's do a demo, uh, and quickly. Um, so the, again, what you're gonna see in this demo is the creation of an attestation that allows us to document a JIRA change request, right? Or some other documentation. You can, it could be a wiki, it could be a threat model, it could be whatever, but it's evidence of why the change is being introduced into this code base, or ultimately into the artifact that is produced. Then we're gonna generate that, the attestations around Celsa build provenance through the use of the witness CLI, which can kind of wrap our build command. And then after that, we're gonna tie the the reference attestation to the hash of the binary that's produced in the build command in a cryptographically sound way using an evidence attestation, which is also available as an in-total predicate. 
And after that, we're going to say, put our little, we'll just dream up a little scenario here. Hey, I'm an InfoSec guy. I just got this binary that looks suspicious. I want to find out, did we build this binary on our systems? And if we did, like who documented the change request, right? Where's that change request at, right? How can we find that out, right? Um, well, we have that, that, that handy dandy data leak. So let me see if I can bring that up now. I'm going to have to like look over my shoulder here. All right. Get it done. So, here you'll see that we are like crafting that uh, that original attestation. Is that readable? Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. No. Oh, dark mode. Um, well, my apologies. Well, what, what you can see here is that there is a Jira URL. I'm not sure if you see that, right? And that's going in this specific metadata type for this attestation that's being used as a reference, right? to the next one okay come on okay all right sorry so now we're looking at the keys that are used to generate the the signature on that attestation and, and they're kind of seeded into the witness command through this witness command uh, config and then next we're actually going to sign that attestation right uh, again witness allows us to cryptographically sign that attestation using those keys and then we're going to take a look at the contents of that signature by taking the payload out of it, which is just base64 encoded in a DSSE, dead simple signing envelope wrapper. Um, we'll take that over to my, one of my favorite tools, CyberChef, and we'll decode that base64 encoding. We'll see that JSON actually is in there, right? Then we're going to store that inside the witness here. Uh, let me move this out the way. That, that, that uh, witness, oh, sorry, the uh, Archivista uh, uh, um, server also offers a REST API that you can then upload these to uh, with a curl command here. Um, and then it also offers this nice GraphQL GUI that allows you to query it and we can prove that it was actually stored, right? It was able to take that uh, get OID that was returned um, by that REST command and then use that as an index into the GraphQL. So then I can take my run command here and is this legible? I'm so sorry if it's not. This is a witness run command, and I'm enabling Archivista so witness actually knows how to automatically upload the attestations, passing in the config, passing in a, a dash A switch to say, I want you to do the Celsa build attestations as well. And then really, the build command is just echoing test to a foo.txt, right? Nothing special, um, but, but again, very contrived demo here. Um, so then that attestation that's created as that run command goes, right? You see the, the run command got, got, got processed here. The attestation that it produced contains the Celsa attestations as well as some others uh, that, that come out of the run command. Um, and then, you know, again, base64 encoded, packed into that JSON, that DISI envelope. And then you see we can upload that and then pull it out. Well, actually, Witness uploaded it for us. And now we can go query the graph for that, uh, for that attestation. We see that it's there, right? Um, now, finally, since we have the run command, we have the hash of the binary, it's just the text file, um, we can create the, do, do, uh, uh, get the SHA-256 of, of that uh, hash of that binary, um, of that artifact. And we also have that, that original git OID, the ID of that reference that, that had that Jira URL now. We, now we can create this evidence attestation that ties the two, two together. So here we have the hash of, which is the subject of this uh, evidence attestation, is the hash of the file, right? And then we are tying that reference attestation to ID number in, and then we're going to cryptographically sign this and also store it in the graph. So this is kind of like the pivot table. This is like how you go from the hash of the binary or the artifact to where the reference or where the evidence is at, right? So we sign that and we're going to upload it to Archivista, right? Using the REST API. We get the ID uh, of that attestation as well, and we can go query the graph and we see that was stored as well, right? Okay, part two. Now we are putting our, our uh, incident responder hat on, right? We got a bi binary that we need to investigate. Where'd the evidence come from? So we just take the hash, we get that SHA of that text file, right? We say, oh, what, 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 what is the hash of this binary so we can identify it uniquely in the graph? So then we take that hash, and then we go to the Graph API. And because, you know, again, this Graph API has like these, this, these schemas spelled out for these attestations, we can actually do a where command on the hash of that, that, that uh, artifact and say, do you have any attestations that apply to this particular file hash? And we get some back, right? Um, and then we, so, oh, okay, let's skip ahead a little bit. Um, we query and we get, we get a response and we find our evidence attestation 
in there. You see this SCAI attribute report. This is our evidence attestation in the mix of, of others that were, were attached to that file hash. So we take that evidence attestation um, and we grab the payload of it. And then we see that there is this git OID in there that is a evidence in the evidence uh, 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 stanza here um, with the git OID, right? So this is some evidence that has to do with that file hash, right? So let's go see what that evidence is, right? So we take that evidence OID, we go back to the REST API, we pull down the attestation associated with it, which hopefully is our reference attestation that we created in those first steps. Um, and then we can inspect that. And then ultimately, when we look at the contents of it, we see that we have, if we can get this out of the way, we see that we have our, finally have our Jira URL, right? So we went from the commit hash of an artifact back to the Jira story that spelled out why the change was instigated in the SDLC in the first place. All right. Can I exit all this? Okay. Yeah, there we go. Sorry. Okay. So some takeaways, right? At this day and age, supply chain security is table stakes. If you're not already started, you probably need to get to it, right? There are a lot of frameworks out there. There's that prior art. There's this work that we're doing now. We intend to do more publications about this. There's tooling. It's available to you. Please get started. It's, it's, it's a, 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 a big threat vector these days. Um, and, then, and then again, my platform engineering hat, don't rely on developers to do it themselves. Make it easy for them. Do the secure by defaults, build it into your platform, that's the way. Um, and also enterprises uh, you know, have similar security needs, but not every enterprise is the same, right? And so work with each other, figure out these deltas, figure out where you can combine your efforts, like this talk today, um, and help, help, help everyone you know, uh, progress this field. Um, and so, uh, the, you know, second to lastly, improving security is an iterative process. The next one actually was just added today. Uh, improving security is an iterative process. So, you know, you can't, you can't possibly boil the ocean. You're gonna have to start somewhere. Do your risk analysis, find the spots that you don't have the visibility, get started there first, um, and then iterate. And then finally, um, Vikram, you know, so aptly put earlier, you know, CI and CD are separate concerns. You have different teams doing those things. You have different abstractions in those areas. They're different phases of the life cycle. Don't treat them as one thing. It really is important. It'll make it, your life a lot easier. Thank you. And with that, we have maybe a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you. Can we get the slide deck? I think it's already uploaded, but we can definitely make and, uh, it available as well. We made a few changes afterwards, like you know, once you uploaded the slide deck, but we'll upload the latest one right after this. Any other questions? We're, we're, we're available afterwards for a little bit as well. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can talk afterwards also. Yep. Okay, great. I see that you're now, or you showed the example of attesting to a Jira ticket or a story. Do you guys have any criteria for what should be attested to and what shouldn't? Um, I think it really is going to depend upon things like what compliance regimes you're up against. You know, like documenting changes is oftentimes spelled out as how it needs to be documented is spelled out in, in those control frameworks. Um, you know, I, I, I like to think that you want to get back to the spirit or intent of what is being done to the code base, right? You need to understand if that spirit or intent was good to begin with. So you need to go all the way left to that. So if someone, if some product manager decided to you know, put in a poison ticket that, that eventually has a backdoor instituted in it through some developer being naive about what's going on, you know, you want to find out who that was, right? So go all the way as, as far left as you can. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, so question for you. For a lot of the open source projects that don't have SBOMs or um, you know, any sort of attestation on them, um, like, do you feel that it's necessary to rebuild those in your own environment so you can generate that, art um, that artifact? It's a great question. Um, you know, you could always help them get started. Uh, there is that Alpha Omega, Omega project, which is tar targeting very critical open source projects. Um, I'm not sure where that's at these days. I know that it was announced quite some time ago. Um, but 
you know, it, it is the case that just like everything else in open source and actually anything, any source that you use, you're going to have to have a smell test on whether or not you want to use it, right? Um, so GitHub stars, things like that. You know, if the SBOM's not there, you know, you can do your static analysis, your composition analysis yourself um, after the fact, like you mentioned. Um, but if you do that, why not publish it and help them out? All right, thank you. Yeah. I have a question about the presentation for the Adobe. Uh, can you give me a little bit louder? Uh, yeah. yeah. So in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, you should have an artifact repository and an artifact cache. Can you elaborate why? And what is the specific technology used in Adobe for the same? Yeah, so um, as far as the artifact caching is concerned, like, you know, the artifact store is mainly for storing the artifacts, but the artifact cache is nearer to where the deployments are. Right, so if, for example, you're deploying in one region in, uh, let's say, US East one or uh, you know some other region of uh, like AWS, let's say in Japan, right? So you, when you're doing the deployments, you want the artifacts to be closer to where the deployments are. So that is where the artifact cache comes into play. So you would have a, a edge location for that artifact cache in Japan as well and you provide that artifact to that edge location so that when you're doing the deployments, they're faster. Because you know, pulling the artifact in Japan from US versus pulling it from Japan itself is going to be considerably faster. Gotcha. And what is the technology used for the thing? So the artifact cache, I think right now we're using AWS ECR uh, mm. for like, you know, having those edge locations where the artifact is uploaded. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Hey, uh, awesome talk. Thanks for giving it. Um, so yeah, CI, CD, they're totally different, and we all know that if we stop to look at the acronym, but they're always, the five characters always squished together. I think maybe leaders can kind of think of them as one thing, even though they're separate. Do you have like a 90-second elevator pitch for like a leadership team that has like a team that's managing both that maybe need to have separate skill sets or disciplines? It was nice seeing that, that last bullet point of like CI and CD are separate things and need to be treated as differently around this process. Well, I, I, w I would just say, and, and I'll pitch it to you really quickly, I would just say that like, like many things inside of organizations that cross organizational boundaries, and, and, and then sometimes you know, CI and CD tooling are held entirely on a platform team. That's not the case at Autodesk. They're held actually two different teams that kind of sit around platform. Um, you know, they, they're, they're, there's different security aspects to them. There's different like trusts and risk, risk vector, or attack vectors and, 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 and risk profiles associated with them. And so when you start to kind of converge everything in an abstraction that sits on top, like the same abstraction that sits on top of both of them, how do you then differentiate all of those things all the way down, right? Um, it just starts to muddy things up. Awesome. I'll wait for the recording so I can copy paste it. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Cool. Thank well, you, yeah, everyone. come talk to us if you guys have any more questions. Yep. We'll be here for a minute. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.